basically the idea came along when the UK's first lockdown happened, really. God, oh my God. <laughs> I was supposed to be moving away, moving out of the country for five months and then, yeah, COVID happened. How are you feeling? <laughs> so it needed time to rethink and like rework what my plan was as a filmmaker whether the city life was right for me because at the time I was living in London I was with my girlfriend and we were sitting together one day we suddenly thought why don't we work out a way where we can be portable, work from home and also be able to, if we needed to, go back to the city, potentially in the house. It was amazing to build this project. It was my first time building, really. And we kind of did pretty much everything ourselves. Just me and my girlfriend <laughs> with no building experience. It was challenging at times, but the thing that made it easy was the U-build structure. It felt a bit like an Ikea build. You'd get sent instructions and you would then follow them and it was very simple. The house is made out of many, many timber boxes. And I just loved the simplicity behind that. Because each box had five parts of timber to it. and we would knock every box together with a hammer and drill them in with some nails. And then these boxes are kind of all piled on top of each other, stacked. And that's what gave us our frame for the tiny house. For us, it only took basically three months to build it. It was a long three months and a hard three months, but we, we, we wanted it to be an accomplishment. It's just amazing to see that there are opportunities for young people to build it themselves, do it themselves. To be able to have their own homes. So these are the ground screws going in. It's crazy. It looks almost like we've shrunk. Honey, I shrunk the kids. So we're using ground screws, these giant screws that go into the ground so it doesn't cause any damage or need to lay any foundations. This is what the cabin will actually sit on top of. So we're going to have 12, I believe, of these giant screws under each of the two cabins drilled into the ground. So this is the machine that's now going to be installing the ground screws. What's amazing about this is the whole thing is just going in with very, very little effort compared to, imagine having to bring in a concrete machine or something. So the whole thing is gonna get driven into the ground and then at the end of the day when we're finished, it can just come right out again. Whew. 
I'm making sure these beams are nice and solid together for uh, the cabin to sit on. So, I don't know, we've got maybe 10 or 12 blocks of wood and we're doing a few screws along each way and keep it nice and solid. <laughs> Good base. This is what we're building. We've got the picture window here. What we've already done yesterday is we've already put down the ground screws and then we put timber bearers which are going to take the boxes. The boxes, you can see the first one on there and then we're just going to lay them out all the way along. So yeah, it's this massive jigsaw puzzle. Um, we're going to be setting out these floor pieces along here, then the walls go on then the roof, and then we put the furniture and internal walls in afterwards. Mm -hmm. Then the end result looks a bit like that. Once we've got all of the boxes together, that's when we tighten all of the bolts and then lock the structure together. When we started an architecture practice, we were trying to create architecture which was beautiful but also sustainable. So what's happening here then? Uh, boxes, floor. boxes are happening. Floor boxes are happening. <laughs> We basically had a client who wanted to build a modular house. They wanted to build something using shipping containers. But we said to them, the problem with that is, although it sounds cool, you can't really self-build shipping containers because you'd need a crane license, you'd need welding license. And, you know, so while it seems modular, actually, it's more just the illusion of modular. We said, what, we, what you really want is if we could get the modules small enough that you could be building them yourself. So with some of our contacts in the CNC world, we basically tried to find a way of making repeatable, strong structural boxes, which could be like that human modular element. You'd think that making some wooden boxes would be actually really easy, but that's kind of been the hardest part for us. Do you need the same size on the end? Or uh, no, those are smaller ones. This one here, I think. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be No, that, sorry, that 600 one there, that shouldn't be there. We started off with the idea of, imagine just using a saw and trying to make a box. I don't know if, any, if, if anyone has ever tried doing that. I, you know, it's really, really hard. I've done that myself. You, you know, you end up, you screw the screw through the end of the plywood and, and it moves and everything kind of goes out of sync and then you can't get it aligned. And then even if you've made a box, how do you then connect it to another one? Do you screw it together? You know, so if you think about it, it's actually quite a difficult problem to solve. And in the end, what we used were a series of clever interlocking joints, which the CNC machine can cut out very easily. But when they come together, they kind of lock in a certain configuration, so they only lock together in one way. That means that anyone can build them, and you know you don't need a, you don't need to be a DIY expert to do it. At the same time, we had to solve things like the structure. So uh, there's a technicality that you can't actually calculate how strong the end grain of plywood is. There's no data for it. So we had to find a different way of doing it. So we're making some fixed windows now. So you can see we've made a lovely bench out of uh, some of the roof boxes. These ones, they've got holes which are offset here because these are going to be holding the glass in. So it's just a case of lining them up like that and then putting the top piece on like that. Where's the door going in the well? Uh, so door is here, from what I remember. Um, and the inside face of that, so we're bolting from the, from the outside. We also had to come up with this modular grid. So, you know, how do you design very a, a small number of units that can perform a wide variety of different functions. So, I was just looking for some of those. Yeah, so we're, basically these ones, they've got special holes in so that they can connect to the walls. So they look very similar to the others, apart from that they have holes. Yeah. 
really we're now at a stage where you can start to see the building really coming together um, so the first things first is we put down the base beneath that as you can see there's the timber bearers and then the ground screws all of the boxes are now open on the inside these are going to be filled with insulation for the meantime we've tightened the bolts up just finger tight so that they're in the right position um, but we haven't over tightened them yet because what we want is for everything to be sort of have a little bit of flexibility while we're building it high then once all of the boxes are in then we tie the bolts and bring it all together you can see that at the corners there's a slightly different situation here because we're connecting between the wall and another wall then some of these boxes have little holes in the face there so that just shows us that it's in the corner um, and the other thing to note is that we've got this kind of signature pattern like this brick bond effect and what the reason we're doing that is that when the wind is blowing on the side of the building this box here strengthens the joint between those two boxes so by the time this is all built it's kind of like a really sort of strong system so as you can see we're going actually up quite high the inside of the building is going to be 2.7 meters to the bottom of the beam in order to make that we've got a 1200 box we've got a 1500 box this one is uh, bottom is a 600 box that's also a 1200 and then I think the last ones that were going to go in that space are 900. The different sizes it becomes once you've built one it's kind of quite obvious because you just find other ones which look the same so you can almost do it just by looking at the picture but it does help because we've also got the dimensions on the different panels so if, if worse comes to worse you can always refer to the label so like this means W means wall, F means it's a face, 6 means it's 600 wide and 12 means it's 1200 long. So once we've got all of the boxes in place, then we're going to get onto the roof. And then from there, it's a case of insulation, cladding, and we're done. If you are a, a skilled carpenter, then I think you can build something which is more affordable than what we're doing, because ultimately, it doesn't get much cheaper than just cut basic wood. Mm. What we're saying is, if there are people who are willing and able to assemble something, you know, let's say that they're able to assemble a wardrobe or something like that, which, you know, I know is beyond the, the capabilities of some, mm. but if they feel that they're up to a challenge like that, then what we're saying is really this is just a case of assembly rather than that you need advanced sort of skill saw usage or you need to know laser measures and that kind of thing. We're not trying to remove the craftsman, we're just trying to lower the entry sort of threshold so that more people feel empowered to join in. So basically there's just going to be a single piece of glass which goes in here and then this one is an opening window so there's going to be a piece of glass in a frame and the frame is going to open towards me so we can get some ventilation. It's quite a nice view. Next thing for us here, we're going to start trying to get the roof boxes on. So we've got the load of boxes over there and we're going to pass them up. Can you hold, if you hold it there? Yep, hold it. So the idea behind the boxes is that they're strong enough in themselves just as you'd imagine like a wooden crate you could stand on and move around so once the individual unit has been assembled it can be sort of moved it can be taken apart it can be put together again and it will still maintain that strength because the individual box the, the parts of that box are screwed together but one box is bolted to the next box so it's really easy to take the bolts out and bolts can be used again and again and again so we've had some buildings which have been taken apart and reassembled five six times so i reckon what you should do with the roof sections is find the part of the roof that's the most comfortable yeah. to put the sections up there's no reason why they would stop being able to do that, providing the waterproofing is still working. <laughs> Hello. 
here we are with the completed frame. We've gone all the way up from the walls and we've now got the roof uh, pieces on the top. We've put in the window frames and all of the bolts which were previously finger tight. Now everything has been put together, we can tighten it all up. So we've gone round with a drill and a socket set and we just tightened up all of the bolts. So now everything's locked together and it's really, really solid. The next task for everyone is to put in the insulation. So we have this lovely sheet wall insulation here, which is gonna go in each one of the boxes. It's already pre-cut so that it just fits in nicely. Yeah. <laughs> On the inside, so as you can see, we've lifted up one of the floorboards, seeing how the insulation goes in. We've got this lovely sheet ball insulation, which is perfectly fitted to the size of the box. Before the insulation goes in, then we just need to tighten up these bolts. Once the bolts have been tightened up, we take the insulation, which is either, if it's a full size, it's already exactly right. For some of the smaller boxes, we either just rip it down or cut it down with a saw. And as you can see, that just fits in really nicely there. We wanna make sure that it's really nicely, tightly fitted up to the edge, because obviously any gap could cause heat to escape. So now that that is all in, last thing to do is to put the um, panel back in. The nice thing is because the panels are two-sided, what we usually do is we'll have a temporary side. So we'll choose the, the side, usually on plywood, there's one side which is nicer and one side which is um, less good quality. So we think that's the nice side. This side is it's still nice, but it's got more knots in it. So while we're doing construction, we have this side up so that if there are any marks, any boards, um, then that can be cleaned and then the board can be switched over so that the finished face is for socks only. There's this quote that we've been uh, coining recently where we've been saying that society is telling us that we need to build back better. But how can we build back better when we've forgotten how to build? The skills of our, of our ancestors have, have been lost. There's been a, a kind of a mini dark ages, I suppose. You know, in the, uh, the sort of post, post-war industrialized nations where it made sense for big economies to do things on a massive scale that, you know, separates people from the process and turns them into a, a kind of a consumer of a, of a mass created thing. But actually, I think what we've seen recently is a kind of a renaissance of sorts. So, you know, people through online tools, kind of you've got people showing you how to wire plugs and pick up tools. And so this, this kind of maker network has kind of revived a lot of these old traditional crafts. People are, are, are celebrating them again. <laughs> So I, I really feel that we're seeing the end of the consumer extractive model. And we're, we're kind of seeing a rebirth of participatory construction that is by people and for people. <laughs> so now that we've got um, the insulation all the way here, you can see that the next layer that's going to go on is this membrane. So. As you can see, what we've started doing here is we've started putting the membrane up on the roof. So you can see the membrane on the top. So we use a membrane which is UV and fire stable. And there's a little gap here. So we're gonna make sure that this is tight on the edge. The other membrane is gonna come up and tape onto it. You can see that now we've got the membrane down. We're putting these little furring strips. This is because we want to use insulation, which is flat, but we wanna put it on a slope so that the rain drains off. So what we're doing, installing some sheet wool in between the battens, and then we have the flat board insulation which is going on top. Once that has been done, and then we can put the membrane on top. We're now making sure the membrane is stuck to the building here. 
because this is going to form a continuous air barrier around the building. We've just lifted this up, we've stapled it along and then um, we run the tape all the way around. So when the membrane is stuck here, the next membrane that's going to come down is also going to stick onto that and then we've got a continuous barrier going all the way around. So what we've got is the first wrap. Um, so this is one roll. They're using the corner of the building to pull it tight. Lovely. So that's nice and tight. We make sure that there's a staple inside every 600 mil. Um, here's Johnny. And as you can see, the building has changed slightly. Uh, we've now got this rather lovely uh, membrane going around the outside. So the benefit of this yeah. is that the uh, building is now protected in terms of air tightness. And it's also providing our weatherproofing layer. We're using a membrane which is UV and fire stable. You'll see that we've started taping up and around the doors. So here you can see that we've cut the membrane to this point here and then we're taping it half on the membrane, half on the door frame. So the tape needs to go neatly crossing over the membrane just to make sure that there no air gets through these gaps which we're going to seal up. Make sure that it's a lovely tight seal and simple to pull off the rest of this. And then and then lining up with the door frame so that we create a nice seal over this cut line and then the door can go in here and the cladding will cover cover over this. You can just see there's another uh, material just hanging over there that's a butyl membrane so this is a it's a rubber rubber roof um, and we get that custom made to the size of each one so it fits over it like a sort of snug little top hat. This is the newest addition to the U-Build family it is a chop saw which runs on a battery which for us at least is very very exciting because it means that we can work on these lovely remote rural sites without needing a generator so we're cutting through these battens here these are going to go on the building the purpose of the battens it does a number of things first of all it pins the membrane on and it makes sure that it doesn't flap around in the wind. Second, you can see that it's also stopping the uh, roof membrane from flying up, so we don't need to put any glue. That means that if we ever need to take the building down for maintenance, we can just lift the roof membrane up as well. These are the battens. We've positioned them, screwed it roughly every 600 mil so that it's really strong in this direction. And we've lined it up with one of the box sort of studs. So when I'm moving across here, you can see that coming up this vertical, the reason that we're putting them on vertically is so that any water that runs off the roof can then just run down to the bottom of the building. If we wanted horizontal cladding, we could just put the cladding straight on now. But because we want it vertical, now that we've done this first strip, we're then going to have to do a second strip going horizontal and then the cladding will come vertical again. <laughs> Next is the membraning of the windows. We started off by membraning over the whole thing and then we just do a cross cut in the middle. We want to leave enough membrane so that the membrane goes up and inside the window frame. You can see what we've started to do is to tape all the way up the inside and actually we want to have a second layer which goes like that make sure that any water which gets in and behind the glass which hopefully it won't anyway doesn't go into the window still behind so once we've yeah, gone no all the way around here like Helen's just doing up there then we're going to be ready to put the glass in ready one yeah. two three okay john's coming round when we put it in and we just uh, we get um, some shims basically. The reason we put the shims in is so that there's room for silicon to go underneath. Otherwise, then there's a risk that we don't get a proper seal. You can just start, start anywhere really. So obviously this isn't perfect yet. It's better to have more in the gap than not enough. Because this also, as well as waterproofing, this is also for air tightness and for noise. 
This is the bit where you uh, where you you fast forward the camera. Play Benny Hill music. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. I don't know, I usually go over with like shim, something like that. They're normal like smoothing tools, but the, the shim actually works quite well. And the brilliant thing is that you've always got them. The U-Build boxes are really the structural frame of the building. So if you leave them on their own outside, then you know they'll get wet. So the way that we deal with that is after the boxes are filled with insulation, they're wrapped with a breather membrane and then we use a sort of system of cladding on top of that. I'd even pry out the box it. We've got some real progress here. You can see the cladding is coming on. This is Western Red Cedar. It's British. <laughs> In order to set it out, we've worked out the total width of the building and we've divided it by the number of boards and then we're adjusting the spacing in between accordingly just to make sure that it's the right width. In each board there are two screws for every batten and we're using stainless steel decking screws. Because they've got their little special head on them you can get them out easily again if we ever need to make any repairs. So they go very very small you don't see them but they've got a kind of little torx connection so that you can get them out easily even though they're that small the reason why we like western red cedar it's one of the most durable softwood materials that we can grow in the uk so this like even untreated will last anything from sort of 15 to 30 years just like this here we have something that's starting to look quite a bit like a cabin So there are various approaches for cladding. We have made these sort of modular panels, if you like, which rather than putting the cladding straight on the building, you make the cladding into squares and then you screw those on. So it means that you can have an assembly line making the panels in a modular way as well. You can clad a building with anything, but we tend to go with more timber and cork based although cork is kind of timber anyway that's our uh, our trademark <laughs> so for wiring the u-build system works very similar to a timber frame system we would do a first fix of wiring which is basically where you run the cables through and then you do a second fix where you put the sockets on. And so you have some options really. Either you can run the wires into the empty boxes before you put the insulation in. And there is also options of surface mounting them and putting them in metal conduits and that kind of thing. Plumbing works in a, in a similar way. Again, it's basically just cutting holes in, in the boxes in the right place. So I think for us, one of the key things about U-Build uh, is that you can unscrew the panels on the inside. So if you need to get access to it in the future, then you can. Because, you know, we know that that's the thing, right? There's something about plasterboard, although we understand why it's used, but it just creates waste and mess, like <laughs> whenever you need to do the simplest of things. So we just wanted an alternative to that. We think that there are opportunities to improve and enhance this. So, you know, whether that's through things like composting toilets or recirculating showers, Bluetooth switches, which mean that you don't need such huge utility systems to kind of back up the sort of small devices. It's obviously quite a wide reaching kind of mission to, you know, sort of make construction simple. What we're trying to work towards is sort of two different models. One which is like closer to home, where we're trying to act as a facilitator to help people. So they can come to us and say, look, I want to build these boxes. I don't really know how. I don't have access to my own CNC machine. Can you just sort of put a kit together for me, please? Then we have other people who either have access to their own CNC machine or are further afield and 
you know, we, we don't want to ship parts all around the world because we just don't think that makes sort of environmental sense. So, yes, we have people who contact us and just say, can I buy the files off you? And depending on who it is, if it's a social organisation, then, yeah, we, we basically give people licences to use them. I suppose the, the kind of downside with this is, as you'd imagine, this is a very sort of difficult thing to, uh, to manage. And so it's a bit like we've... We feel in some ways a bit like we're a software company, um, kind of with different versions that we're always releasing. No one's ever 100% happy because they, they're always like, oh, but can you just do this one and can you just do this one? <laughs> I think Ubuild can be used for a, quite a wide variety of different things. So on our, on our website, we have examples of everything from small pieces of furniture up to entire houses. The place where it has exploded <laughs> over the past year has been in on the, the fringes uh, of conventional architecture. This is where all the, the best creative ideas come in the, in the garden, down the bottom of the garden. Um, Partly because I think people like the idea of self-building, but then they also get tied up in the, the planning system and the building regulation system. and. It's not to say that those things aren't important, but having to submit planning permission feels like quite a big thing for somebody and they almost don't know where to start. Whereas there are many more people who feel as though they have the skills or the, the willingness to just go and build a studio in their garden or to put something on a trailer. I think it's that impatience to just get on and start making something that seems to drive those sort of projects. But we, we, we've, we are also working on bigger things like offices and small factory houses so they can work equally well for that I think it's just that you need to get more people on board you need to have a contractor who understands it you need to have mortgage companies who understand it there are various problems to overcome including how to make sure that the building stands up and is safe. You could imagine people building using blocks in a kind of Minecraft style way where they just start and just build. And, you know, we have done that. But there's been some kind of mass participatory construction like there were some protests in central London with Extinction Rebellion where well, basically the crowd built structures. It came at a really important time where we were being told that there was 10 years for us to radically change the way that we interact with the world and use energy and interact with nature. I think a lot of people were really inspired to do something about it. The U-Build system, somebody, um, and we obviously no one knows how, managed to donate the files to Extinction Rebellion. These boxes were then made uh, en masse by volunteers. And then they were all delivered into Trafalgar Square. And so while there were boxes being delivered, there were also these kind of interesting ideas for like, oh, what sort of things could you build with boxes and how might you build things? Although that is one way of doing it, a better way is to try and come up with some templates that work, so some predetermined templates for success. So the structure engineer who we've worked with have tested different configurations to make sure they're safe. And usually the way we deal with safety is people come to us with a design, we run it through our system, we sort of say to them, yes, this will work, and then they go away and build it. So I, I think if this was completely open source, there would be a question over who would take the responsibility for it. And, and that's, that's why we've kind of arrived at the idea of us being like the custodians of, of the knowledge. It definitely feels like not just a house, it feels like a piece of you in a way, especially when you build it, because it's 
something so personal to you and like everything that's inside and everything that's that, that we've structured for we've designed it for ourselves as well as living in it you know you feel very at peace inside because you know what you've created is you yours for you and there were kind of no there was nothing ever really that kind of like got in the way of the design if we wanted a pitch roof you bill would do it and um if, if we wanted it to be on a trailer it just happens so it's so personal it almost feels like a piece of art or something that, that's tangible living in the tiny house the way i would describe it is peaceful we are in a very rural area but it's also very peaceful inside because we designed it so there is a an element of peace inside it because we didn't have to make any changes we don't have to go back to using a hand saw and a chisel in order to participate in construction Whether or not we feel that this is a good thing or a bad thing, technology is, is with us for, for quite a, I don't know, it is in quite a big way. I don't think we're going to get away from that. If we as individuals learn these skills and are able to, to, to use them for the right reasons, then they're, they're tools like anything else that can be used for good or bad. Mm-hmm.